Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission meeting. If you would join with me to do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, this is a notice regarding the appeal of any decision for the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission pursuant to the provisions of Section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws. Notice is hereby given that if you are not satisfied with a decision by the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission, that's us, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission decision. We advise you that you seek your own independent legal advice to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. And has the commissioners had an opportunity to read the minutes that was previously sent to us by Mr. Fields? All right. Um, Move to approve. Um, yes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The minutes are approved. I'm going to, we, we have an agenda with a certain order in here, but in the interest of trying to take, uh, prioritizing some things and also taking a matter that ought to be fairly uh, quick to deal with, I'm going to take it a little bit out of order today. And, but I am going to start with the consent items. Mr. Fields, would you give us a short description of what we're looking at? And do you think we can, if, if we want to approve these, if there's no issues, can we improve, approve them as a block? Yes, sir, I think you can. Uh, the, uh, if, if you allow me, I can read them into the, uh, into the uh, record for today. Under uh, items to be considered for consent, other passenger vehicles for higher company applications. AM Limo, Beland Transportation, Bilal Limo, Bella Limo Company, Frank Transportation, High Point Enterprise LLC, King and Queen Limo Service, KNA Limo Service, Morale Company LLC, Mills Enterprise Trans, Moshine Limo, Premier Nashville Limo, Limousine LLC, Regal Black Car Service, LLC, Robinson Fleet, LLC, South Tree Transport and Logistics, LLC, Sovereign Luxury Transportation, TAV Transportation, TN Luxury Rides, Totally, LLC, and Zane Transportation. You also have uh, three requests under OP, uh, uh, two requests under OPVH, review a request to change New Roz Limo to Orvan Transportation at 1002 Villa Circle in Lebanon. Uh, review a request to change Rock and Roll Rides address to 918 North 14th Street, Nashville 37206. And last, there are two record cut general record companies, Raybon Towing LLC and ABA. Uh, all of them have uh, filed the appropriate paperwork and, and are in order. Hey, Mr. Fields, just because we have several new members on our um, commission, when it says considered for consent, this is because by our rules, regulations, that our commission must approve these after you have reviewed the applications. And um, that's yeah. basically... Uh, un unless there happened to be some, some problem with the application, we found uh, an inconsistency, we found something that wasn't appropriate, uh, then... It would be the the the, the uh, process of the commission is to approve uh, uh, the items. Right. Move to approve. Second. All right. Does anybody have any questions about what we're doing here on this matter right now? I know Commissioner Carr is familiar with this, uh, having been on for several years. Okay. There's been a motion. There's been a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I assume that was a motion to approve all of them as one block. Yes. All right. The minutes would reflect that, please. All right. Now, I would like to go out of order. 
I know we're all waiting to talk about the proposed uh, alternative routes, but I'd like to take care of a high priority matter for today. Mr. Fields, I'd like to skip to the shared urban mobile mobility device contracts. Could you talk to us a little bit about that, please? Yes, sir, I can. The, uh, the SUMDs, or the scooters, uh, ha operate under a contract that was developed through an RFP three years ago. It also requires a certificate of public convenience and necessity. Uh, the contract for, the, for uh, the SUMDs expires on June the 13th of each year. It was original contract was for, uh, it could be one year contracts up to 60 months. So it could be five one year contracts. This would be the third year of their contract and it would be a, so it'd be a third approval for the commission. So today staff would recommend that you approve not only the contract, but also renew the certificate of public convenience and necessity for bird, for lime and for spin. You mentioned RFP. Could you uh, uh, elaborate on what that stands for? Uh, about four years ago, the Metropolitan Council decided that it was uh, appropriate to uh, regulate and to uh, establish a baseline for uh, the operation of scooters. You, you, some that will remember, we at one time had seven or eight companies that were operating in Nashville with with little authority, little regulation. Uh, the Metropolitan Council passed a ordinance that required you to uh, develop an RFP and, uh, uh, and then uh, use that to determine who should operate and who should not. So with the assistance of the Metro Finance through their procurement division and Metro Legal, we developed an RFP which, the Metro, which you approved and uh, it was put on the streets and these, the three companies were the successful uh, they were successful in being chosen to uh, being recommended to you to be selected. You then took the you took the time and you heard, had the hearings and you selected who would be the operators. And we have to find under the standard of a public necessity and convenience to renew the contract. And I see up on the board SUMD a description there. Does that elaborate a little bit on the increased use of the? Um, SUMDs. Yes, sir. If uh, when and I'm going to defer over to uh, Mr. Schlafer to be able to describe uh, the the usage and and how that has changed over the last couple of years. Also, if you could tell us who's using them. For sure, <clears throat> the increase you see in the scooter maximum fleet would be the result of votes of this commission um, to expand the WeGo pilot program. Still 500 scooters per company by contract. Uh, we've gone from 100 to now 200 in the WeGo pilot program. Those are placed for first and last mile outside of the downtown core, outside of the midtown music road kind of area. And uh, those are used more by local riders, uh, bus stops, multi-housing units, those, those types of things. That um, term of art, first mile, last mile, could you elaborate on that, please, sure, for sure. our new commissioners? It's um, a, a ride to get home. So maybe you take the bus, uh, you hop off the bus, you still have a bit of a walk home. This gives you the opportunity to hop on a scooter and take that last mile home or the first mile in the morning back to the bus stop or um, whatever way you're commuting. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, what, 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 are we, what are we looking at? What are the st statistics so, telling us? And everything I've been told from working with Populous, which is our, our data kind of platform where we um, are able to track the scooters, where they're used, the number of rides, heat maps on the locations. For the number of scooters we've got in Nashville, we're seeing a very high usage rate per scooter ride per day. Um, so you've seen in 21 and 22, uh, 1.25 million rides plus in each of those years with only 1,800 scooters out there. Um, statistics that have been provided to us from the industry indicate somewhere between 25 to 40 percent of the rides are from locals. Um, we certainly do get a lot of tourism. We get a lot of rides down on Broadway, Demumbrian, and um, in, in, in that zone. But uh, there is a strong indication that they're being used as well by, by folks commuting. I see a big sure. jump in the total dockless e-bike rides. What's that about from 2022 to 2023? In 2022, uh, commission approved a uh, dockless e-bike pilot to begin. That began December uh, 13th. So you only had a handful of days there in 2022 where they were out there and it was pretty cold. So it didn't get a whole lot of rides. Uh, we've seen a, a number of ride increases every month since December in the e-bike pilot. The e-bike pilot is currently kind of 
on the west side of town. It um, excludes the downtown core and excludes east and south of Nashville. So it's a small area and uh, we're only operating with up to 75 e-bikes at this time. Um, so those numbers would increase with an increase in the pilot if and when that would come. I have a question. The data for 2023, that goes through April or May or sometime in May? Uh, I, I pulled that data this morning. So that was as of yesterday. Okay. And Thanks. what you'll see uh, typically in Nashville, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, we'll all have over 100,000 rides. So we're trending just as we were in 21 and 22 to, to have over a million rides again this year. Any other questions? I, I, it said the dockless e-bike uh, pilot program is supposed to have 75 bikes. So yours truly was looking at their apps this morning and they don't have 75. So please encourage our contractors <laughs> to get more bikes out there. We'll continue to encourage and, and, uh, and, and prod them along uh, as, they, as they operate. For what it's worth, I'll look at other cities occasionally. Seattle has a great dashboard and they average about two rides per scooter, I think, per day. And so this is a, similar to that. And they're at like, I think, 4,000 scooters and they also have about 2,000 bikes. And so that should be where we're trying to get to. And, and Commissioner, in, in the summertime, we're well over four rides per day. Four? In the summer. So this would be averaged out, obviously, throughout the whole year. We don't get much in the winter, but um, summer rides are high. And, and I think the critical part uh, is Mr. Schlafer described is the the local usage. One of the issue, issues coming in was uh, several years ago is well locals mm -hmm. aren't going to ride them. Mm -hmm. Well, st from based on the information that we're receiving and that we're reviewing, they are being ridden. So every assuming just that some of those rides are replacing cars, a huge portion of the, of, of car trips are being reduced, which is good for everybody. So. Uh, you know, it, it's the thing that the Metro Council asked you and me to do was to partner with the scooter companies to make it successful. And at this point, I think we're meeting our goals and we're successful. Mr. Fields, for uh, at least three of us that have been on here for several years, we heard lots of complaints about scooters being abandoned on greenways, being abandoned in the street, on sidewalks, blocking um, uh, disabled people's access to, to the sidewalks. Have the complaints gone down or leveled out or are they increasing? I always let Mr. Slafer deal with negative things, but <laughs> no. Uh, but, but seriously, well, you gave him the positive we, things we, today. We do have, uh, uh, we continue to have complaints and it's, it's, it's typically user complaints. Again, he deals directly with the companies on the complaints. But, and also I, I wanted to know how are the, one of the things we emphasized to the companies with the pilot program was responding to abandoned scooters. I, I'd like to know what your thoughts, your experience has been with that. My experience over the last 15 months has been there's not a lot of folks that are lukewarm about scooters. You either love them or you hate them. Mm -hmm. um, so we do, we do still get complaints. And it, like you said, it's the response time from the operators. And I've got contact information for all of them. I know there are team members that go out and rebalance. Um, we, we, have, we have challenges sometimes uh, with greenways because that's a, a linear park as I've learned and that's much more difficult to geofence than a large area say like Centennial Park where we have less issues but again um, can be reported through hub can be reported uh, directly to Mr. Fields or to myself can also be reported through the app itself any issues with rebalancing and I'm always hearing back from them within an, within an hour as your rules require. And that geofencing uh, we were looking at that to prevent the scooters from going into certain areas and and also uh, there was uh, uh, speed limiters or monitors on the on the scooters as well 15 miles an hour is your rule for mm -hmm. all scooters across the county they're capped at 15 um, on Broadway lower broad it's an eight mile an hour zone uh, just to keep mm -hmm. folks from running too quickly through there and they are all in compliance there so what you need from us today mr. Fields is a motion to either approve or to not approve continuing the contract and it's a one-year contract and the certificate of public convenience and, necessity. and, and the certificate of public yes, convenience it's a one, it, it will be uh un, unless you take action between now and next june it would be valid to next june 13th would the numbers remain the same or are we looking at more scooters uh, over time i mean 
obviously there's a process and a, a, a way to do that, mm -hmm. but that would I couldn't predict that at the time. And they would actually come back to you. Yeah. Okay. And there is a fleet increase metric in your rules whereby the operators mm -hmm. can come ask for more. I believe they've been holding back with the Connect Downtown study ongoing. Um, see how that turns out. See where they can fit in and, and do it sustainably. Okay. Does anybody else have some questions, comments, thoughts, discussion? I was, I was going to say one thing. We, he, uh, he mentioned the uh, uh, geofencing uh, about greenways specifically. If you look We've got greenways that are, you know, out in the woods, you know, that I ride on going to Percy Priest Dam, and there are greenways like the urban, the Gulch Greenway, which I'm not sure why that's a greenway. There's not a lot green about it. So at some point, and, uh, not today, obviously, I think we need to go and look at all of that. Uh, you know, why, why can't you use a scooter down there? Uh, I, I'm sure there are some people opposed to that, but if they're truly tra for transportation, uh, what the heck? Why shouldn't you be able to use it on the, you know, the Gulch Greenway at least? So. And I'd add the pedestrian bridge to your list of grievances there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, why is that a Greenway? I've never figured that out. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? I'll make all a right. motion. Make a motion. Given all the numbers and facts that we see and how. I would say great of a turnaround it is on our on the on the on this scooter journey we've been on. I definitely see uh, the need and the necessity for it. So I make a motion to approve. The, oh, oh, Mr. Field, the contract and the certificate to approve the contract and the certificate. All right. Did I hear a second? All right. All those in favor of approving the motion to con to renew the contracts and for the certificate of public necessity and convenience, say aye, please. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. Now, I think the next thing on our agenda, Mr. Fields, is the consideration of the proposed limit alternative operational routes for entertainment transportation vehicles, pedal carriages, and pedal cabs to apply during the period that the Broadway Viaduct is closed for construction. I will do my best on this particular issue. I, I had hoped that our deputy director would be present. I, can we can we get oh, the map up? Oh, I'm sorry. Still? Thank you. Uh, today we wanted to introduce the idea that we need to respond to the issue of the Broadway Viaduct closure during construction for about two months this summer. On a daily basis, it's my understanding that about 26,000 vehicles are utilizing this particular uh, route to, to get into downtown. Uh, the question then becomes, where do they go and how are they directed? Uh, with, with that volume, there was great concern expressed during these meetings, if you'll remember earlier this year, that you know, respond and ask NDOT to take a look at it to see what might be. Uh, so what we've done is put together uh, a, a, a two-part, a, a large, a, a circle of sorts that would be used for the entertainment transportation vehicles and then a smaller grid that would be used for pedal carriages on the, in the inside. Again, the goal to make sure that we're moving traffic as best we can during this, uh, well, what's going to be a challenging two-month period. So today, what we wanted to do was introduce it, to get it out. It's placed on our website. I shared it. Uh, I hope all of our operators that would be fit in these categories got copies of it. If my email information they provide is accurate, they did. Uh, and uh, then ask that uh, by June the 12th, which is a Monday around noon, uh, or by the end of the day, if anybody has any comment, to put it in writing and send it to this commission so it can be uh, then shared with uh, NDOT, with the commissioners, to be able to come back on June the 22nd to make a final determination of if, you know, what, if anything, needs to be done to deal with that particular issue. The one thing we did not want to do, and I'm, I, I, I hope they know this, we did not want to have any uh, surprises today. We did not want anything. We're going to make this happen today. We want to make sure that it's out there. People have an opportunity to uh, tell us. And again, the best way to tell us is going to be in writing. So 
Uh, so you're certainly welcome to discuss it. And, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I'm not an engineer, so I can't go a whole lot further than that. But uh, we can certainly carry any information or concerns you have back to uh, our engineers and engineer division. All right. I think each of the commissioners have received a copy of the map. Is that correct? All right. Could, could we move that around so the public could see the, the big display? And then, Mr. Fields, I know I talked to you about this. I said, where exactly is the Broadway uh, aqueduct? All right. If you look at the corner of the lower box on the left-hand side, about where the point is, is about the viaduct. Because what it is, if you, if, you go down eighth, if you go down Broadway to uh, when you pass the, uh, uh, the, the federal building uh, on the left-hand side, you're going to be coming to, uh, to a bridge. And most people just call it a bridge, but it's a viaduct, and it's going over no, Mr. Hayes has joined us. Uh, we are going, and it is, it's going over uh, the, uh, the the rail yards that are below. Uh, that particular bridge is set for uh, major uh, construction improvements, replacement uh, by TDOT uh, for the summer. They anticipate the bridge being closed in the vicinity of July the fifth, and then remaining closed until the end of August. Uh, you know, obviously I can't predict what may or may not happen, but we did the last project we had like that downtown Nashville. You remember the weekend closures we had with, uh, with uh, TDOT a few years ago with construction and worked very well. And now we have the director of NDOT here as well. So I think we can hopefully respond to whatever you may have. Ms. Alicorn, I, I just presented the map and the concept. And I turned the big board around so the public could see what we were looking at because we all got a copy of it already. <laughs> no but, problem. Uh, well, hold on one second, please. Uh, we're, um, can we make sure that the minutes reflect the addition, the additional people who have shown up now? Okay. And um, so what you want to do today, Mr. Fields, is you'd like to make sure that we are presenting what the proposal is. You're telling us what it is, the length of time it's expected. And then also, if anybody has, if any of the public has comments they want to make, they should do it in writing by June yes. the 12th. Today is not a public hearing on it. Right. It is a, because, again, it's, it's, it's brand new. It's brand new. So we want to make sure everybody has an opportunity because, again, that's been driven home very clearly to me that this is not a, this isn't a, a gotcha or a catcher. Right. Direct, Director Alarcon, could you elaborate a little bit more? Yes, thank you Go very ahead. much. My po apologies for being tardy. I am bouncing between three meetings at one time. Um, we actually had our traffic engineers take a look at um, a potential route. Um, we are expecting, so basically with the closure of the Broadway Viaduct, we have uh, about 20, uh, over 25,000 cars that we have to move in a different direction. So in working with our traffic engineering, uh, pulling data and information that we got through Connect Downtown, they looked and pulled together what they felt would be a good proposed route for consideration during just the construction closure of the bridge. And so this is not a permanent one. It would just be for the time that the bridge is closed so that we could ma manage the traffic flow and not be overwhelmed. So that's where this is coming from. Understanding that we're not 100% familiar with a lot of business practices, we wanted to have a chance to put it out in the public so we could get the feedback about concerns and issues and their business practice and then look at making adjustments based on also the data that we have. So so this was just an opportunity to put it out in the public, make y'all aware, and then we'll pull all that together, take all of that into consideration, look at the data, have our traffic engineers, um, look at if there's a need to revise the, uh, the map and what that will look and feel like, and then we'll bring back to y'all a actual um, route that we would ask for everyone to follow while the bridge is closed. Thank you. Outside blue line is the proposed entertainment transportation vehicle route. Correct. And then the alternative is that seems to be around Nissan Stadium, appears to be something that could be added to it as well. Correct. And then finally, the pedal carriage is the green route that we're looking on here as well. Correct. And uh, again, these are not in stone at this time. Not at all. And it's just being brought to today for some discussion and just for everybody to become familiar with what's being proposed and for public input to be in writing by June 12th and then 
Yes, sir. Further review by your, your group? Yes, sir. Further review okay. by our traffic engineer. The proposed alternative route around the Nissan Stadium is there is some current utility construction that is planned, and there is the potential of that road not being available, so that's why we offered an alternative route just in case. Do you have available maybe both for the public and for the commission uh, the TDOT website that shows the air closure? And the, the I mean, I, I've, I'm familiar with it, but I don't know that the rest of the commission and certainly the you public. Can, I can pull it up. It's on, I mean, it's on the website. It talks about the dates. It yeah. talks about yeah. how the, the kind of pretty significant, when you look at the traffic flow. Yes. Uh, the impact to both the Montbrian and Church Street. Correct. As well as fourth. As well is going to be a pretty big hit. And second. Yes. That's why I was wondering about the proposed pedal, ca pe pedal carriage route seems to be going right down to Mumbrium and on Commerce, is that? Yes, sir, this? but we had to take into consideration where their current um, um, business is set up. Yeah. We have one pedal cat tavern that is actually just over the bridge, uh, the interstate bridge on to Mumbrium, and that's where their folks park and pick up. And then we have another one that's a little bit further up um, on, in, in Sobro, and Southboro and Sobro, where they actually have people park and then they begin their ride there. So we did feel excuse me, um, and looking at that, that that would work as long as we had the ETVs and them separate. And that's why we, uh, the traffic engineering team was comfortable with it. Um, and I know that we've gotten some feedback already from them that we'll have the team take into further consideration. So again, this was to give an opportunity to put it out in the public so that we could have the conversation before we asked y'all to take a vote and could hash out a lot of those concerns that everybody would have. And that's including the, com the, the business community as well. Thank you. And just to clarify, the uh, current pedal taverns do not have a required route, correct? I'm sorry. The, the pedal taverns don't, at this moment, have a required or defined route. So this would be the temporary route that we would be implementing just for this particular emergency situation. Correct. As a matter of fact, as of to this today, really no one has a defined route or route except for sightseeing. But and so the, and we're pretty familiar with what their route is that they follow for their business practice. The rest of the county, though, is open for the pedal taverns. Most they, definitely. They can go anywhere else. And, and I think the, the intent behind NDOT's recommendation is it's going to be really challenging to navigate downtown. It will take the primary artery offline. It will be. Right, Dombrian's one lane each direction. Um, and you put a special event in there and we're really, so we're, we're taking all of that into consideration. Anybody else have thoughts, observations? I, I have a question is, and I've seen some comment from some of the operators and some of the general public as well now. And a couple of questions were, is this the only route that will be available to the ETV? So at the moment, we planned one route based on what the, we feel the traffic impacts. So if they want to consider another route that's outside of the city, um, the, in, the downtown core, the, or I, I want to say inside the inner loop, we're more than open to consider it. Um, we just want to make sure that they're not going to be going through a neighborhood. That's really important to us. So for example, we're not going to let them go and, and run all over Midtown because we have a lot of residential in Midtown and stuff. So we wanted to give them the opportunity to have a route during this time frame because of the amount of traffic impact that we're anticipating with the closure of the bridge. Uh, the engineers looked at what the routes are, what the traffic volumes are today, and with the impact of the new traffic volumes, what they felt it would be. And this is where we came up with this route that we felt that we had the roadway capacity and the volumes would be able to handle that additional, um, especially with the slow moving vehicle. So there was a lot of thought about putting it behind it. I know there's some interest in them being in Midtown, but I have, uh, you know, today, Ricky and I were talking on the way over Hub Nashville. We got over in the last month, over 112 complaints on noise from the ETVs and most of it's coming from the Midtown area and, you know, I just, I, I can't say I'm gonna create a route that's gonna put everybody over Midtown and just disrupt uh, that quality of life for the residents because there's a very high residential area over there. Yes. 
67,000 people working and 17,000 people living downtown. Yeah. We've got a much greater concentration in the downtown neighborhood than in Midtown. Yeah. I mean, I, I, and that's why we kind of pushed it out and felt like if we moved it in the outer, again, it was based on traffic volume. I've already heard from uh, some law firms on Music Row about the noise of some of the ETVs there, but, uh, but it, it does seem like a, a potential route for them to, to, to go there. But. Well, we are hoping that all of our ETV permitted folks that have uh, their certificate in occupancy will start being a lot more respectful of the noise. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be one of the largest complaints. Um, and it's pretty consistent, you know, uh, um, 112 complaints in one month. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much three a month that are coming in, those that are being reported, and we know there's a lot more than that. So it would be really great if there's any of those folks that are here today would be thinking about that and how they can be more respectful about the quality of life of those folks that do live and, um, and work in the downtown community because it is extremely disruptive. And maybe perhaps also we could ask them to think about the uh, kind of music they play because some of the music is a little bit um, rude. Um, I'm going to say rude. Um, and we do get a lot of families that visit with us. And it's not something I would want even my young teenage child to listen to. So uh, I would just say um, it would be very helpful if they would be thoughtful about this as we continue to move forward on this practice. Question? You mentioned there was 112 noise complaints in the Midtown area. How many do have we had in the downtown area would be one question. And the qu follow up to that was in my limited time on this commission, I've noticed that the violations that we've seen over the last several months all seem to be with the inspectors in the downtown core. Do we have inspectors out in the Midtown area? So if you recall, um, we are cross-training right now. We've added the enforcement. Uh, they actually began enforcing over in the Midtown area last weekend. So it is taking us a while to get actually everybody um, on board, hired, trained up so that they knew exactly how to handle it. And we uh, did finally get direction on how to handle noise. So we are getting everybody trained on that because we can write violations. Um, for noise, and so we are going to start doing that as well. So we're hoping, though, I'm asking again that the folks that are, if there are folks sitting in the room, they be considerate of um, the area around them. There are folks that work and live in our downtown core, as well as in our midtown area, as also in the south area of our town. It would just be very helpful if they would think about that instead of having the noise blasting, but we will be starting our citations on noise level as well. I'll have to get you the number for the um, for the downtown. There, it, it is it is high. It's not as high as Midtown, but it is high. Thank you. Are we so on the violations for noise? Are we equipping the enforcers with decibel readers, or how are we enforcing that? Yes, sir. We will be, yes, we are going to, they'll have decimal readers and they will be recording that. They'll also be videotaping it. And they'll be videotaping the decimal reader as well as what they're, they're going to be citing for. All right, I think that's all we needed to do today on that matter, right? If we can get the names of uh, whoever, uh, June the 12th, if we can get public in writing, so it makes it a whole lot easier to work with when we're trying to, uh, put together uh, plans and, and review for uh, the, the staff that needs to be reviewing it, as well as bring it to back to the commission. And then in our June meeting, we'll be having a, a we'll be looking at the final proposal and making a decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, we will try to get this posted out in advance as well so the community has a chance to view it before we actually get to this meeting. Um, I would say reference to uh, code, whatever's in code is we're following the same decimal level in the code. The, the, the simple answer, Chris, is if we're within 50 feet and it's audible, it's a violation. So the violation is and then people don't understand what audible means. Uh, audible means if you can hear the sound. Not if I can hear the, the no, no public. I'm just, t I'm answer, I shouldn't have even answered the question, but that's the answer. All right. We're going to move on then to the driver application reviews. Mr. Fields. Yes, sir. Uh, we have some uh, drivers. Uh, we are going to uh, not have the screen on. 
uh, it, uh, we have several drivers that failed to fully reveal. Uh, if I may, I may, may I call the drivers? Mr. Boyd, D'Angelo Boyd. Mr. Fields, before you begin on individual ones, I, I noticed in looking at these applications, it's the same thing over and over again. People failing, well, often in here, in here, it's people failing to re, to report citations, violations, convictions, arrest over a period of time. And some of them seem to be somewhat understandable because they're 1990, 1991, maybe even 1995, and they're, they're minor infractions. Um, but then there's others that are closer in time and some even more serious. Um, should we be looking at these differently now? When a driver applies at the commission level, we, on the face of the application itself, in the ordinance and on the face of the application, it's very clear that we want any arrest charges, so forth and so on. The staff then also cautions them. And if a driver puts a zero or writes none or not applicable, they will, they will then ask, are you certain? And they will be advised that they could be denied based on not uh, completing the application. So uh, I'm not real certain that there's a lot more we know to do beyond the position the commission takes. And, you know, if you deny them at this level, they can't reapply for 90 days. If I deny, they have to actually be placed back on the agenda, if they choose, at the next uh, commission meeting. So in these cases, they were, they were not denied as much as I just I wasn't going to deal with them. I'm going to bring them to the commission for you all to deal with. So... Uh, you have several that wrote zero or none, or and they do range from very old and where you know it's, over the years the oldest one we ever had that was failed to it was a 1970 something that was 20 some years ago, but there will be some 1998s and some and some 2000s that uh, you know you do see that it, it could have been forgotten, especially if it wasn't that serious, versus something that. Well, happened within the last few months. Right. Okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Well, afternoon now. How you doing? Mr. Fields, you want to give us a little description about in, Mr. Boyd's in, situation? In this application, uh, he indicated zero. When we uh, did the fingerprint background check, uh, the, I mean, obviously there was a finding from the uh, TBI they came back that revealed several charges, including um, uh, December of 2022, a simple possession uh, charge that ended up uh, being not prosecuted, but certainly charged uh, last December. Uh, 2018, a failure to appear. Uh, a 2019, theft of property less than 500. Uh, there was a deferred disposition. There was a diversion on that. Then there was a reckless driving that's listed in 2015. So it, it listed zero, and those were the ones that came up. So it listed none, and, we, and, and the earliest one was actually December of 2022 for possession of marijuana. Yes, sir. Um, I had failed to, I guess, get all of my record expunged. Everything except for the last thing that was happened has been expunged and has been dismissed off of my record. So, um, and then to account for the charge that was here in 2022, um, I'd actually bought CBD from Broadway and ended up in Fairview, got pulled over, they took it, and then they gave me probation. Well, this thing, you know, we do this. It says to list even expunged defenses. You, I was, you read, right? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I read 100%. I, I, misunder, I misunderstood, and my apologies for that. And it would not be disqualified from the disqualifying section. None of these would disqualify him. It's just a matter of you've asked if it, if it was not revealed to bring them to you. And what disqualifies him is, or, or what can, gives us the authority to deny his application, is this failure to report these. That's how important these were. I understood. They told me to come back, and I redid it, and I actually put every single charge that was on there there. So, like I said, my apologies about it. Well, that was after the uh, Mr. Fields in his office advised you that you had not been you had not fully disclosed on your application. My apologies. I 
I, I want <laughs> I've served on the committee for years, and, and I, it, this is just such a redundancy. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's almost you wonder if we should put an explanation of what the word expunged means. Uh, you know, maybe there's not a lot of clarity uh, in that because it's, it's, it, I mean, this takes a, a lot of our caseload uh, is just, oh, I forgot, and then they divulge it. And we don't, we don't want to deny you the opportunity because you didn't put it on there because obviously we're going to find out and we know about it now and we can review it. But this is, this is a, something that's unnecessary or should be unnecessary. So, I mean, I just, I don't know if, you know, maybe that can be broken down into more layman terms. I know it's pretty elementary, but, you know, is the word any you know, on there anywhere? I mean. Yeah, I, I guess we could just make it plain and say, have you ever been arrested? Each. <laughs> Each law violation of a federal, state, or local law which you have been charged or arrested or whether convicted or not including expungements. So. Maybe, maybe explain that word expungement. He, he knew what expungements it. meant when he, if he read it. He knows what it means. Well, your marijuana case out of December of 2022, that has not been expunged, has it? No, sir. They put and it would be kind of important for us to know if you were using, if you were charged with possession of marijuana when you're applying for an application to drive a vehicle for the public, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. That makes sense. Yes, sir. And you were aware of that back when you filled out this application? Yes, sir. So why shouldn't we just deny your application since you didn't tell the truth? All I can say is I apologize. Like I said, I re misread the application. I didn't know at the time that I needed to put everything. I had no idea. Like you, I said, I'm sorry. You had no idea you had to put an arrest for, for possession of marijuana in, in just six months ago on your application to drive for the public? Like I said, sir, it's my apologies. And it wasn't marijuana. It was CBD that they considered it to be marijuana. I'm not going to go back and forth about it. I lost that bill, so it's okay. Yeah, what's your disposition on that case? Say it again, sir. What is your outcome of that case? Um, the outcome of that case was pretty much they looked at my record and saw that everything wasn't as fun. It's the same as the situation, and they pretty much just charged me accordingly, which, like I said, I ended up with a year of probation for two grams of CBD that I bought from Broadway. So, Okay, so you were found guilty. 100%. You got 11 months, 29 days sentence. 100%. Suspended for 11 months, 29 days probation. 100%. Has nothing to do with any expungements or anything else before. You got probation on a on possession of marijuana charge. Yes, sir. And you were convicted of it. Yes, sir. So why are you trying to tell me that CBD and you got all these explanations? Well, I'm just letting you know the situation. That's all. Okay. But the court found you guilty of possession of marijuana, not CBD. That's what they said. And you didn't put that down here? You're on probation right now. Yes, sir. There is no way I'm going to believe that you were confused about what this paragraph asked you for when you were filling out your application while you were on probation. That's okay, sir. Like I said, I apologize. You on supervised probation? Um, no, it's actually unsupervised. unsupervised, yes, sir. I have to mail in every month. You have to what? Mail in. I just mail in to let them know that I'm in compliance. So when you filled out your application on March 16th, you had to mail in at least three previous compliances to your probation officer, right? Yes, sir. That's all I've got to ask. I express the same frustration you the Commissioner Carr does about just I think you didn't want us to know about it. It's not the situation at all. I mean obviously you guys can pull it. You totally can know about it. It's all public record, so it's nothing that I can hide. I'm not incompetent. Just a mistake. That's all. And people make mistakes and that's okay.
Mr. Fields, do we have a legal obligation to ask for the applicant to disclose this information? I, I'm, or maybe Ms. Kostanis? Um, so I'm looking at Tennessee Code Annotated sec Title VI, um, Chapter 54, Section 128. Um, in counties having a period, a population, excuse me, in counties having a population in excess of 100,000, according to the 2000 federal census or any subsequent federal census, um, which of course Davidson County is over, um, it is hereby declared that access to criminal conviction histories by municipalities that choose to license and require persons operating vehicles for hire um, and further choose to disqualify an applicant for a license for, or a permit for any speci specified criminal offense serves a law enforcement purpose. So I think that is um, kind of maybe not very well known that that provision does apply to what this commission does. Um, and um, generally, when um, uh, matters are expunged, I think people talk to their criminal defense attorneys, they kind of have an understanding that, um, you know, if they um, uh, don't plead guilty or adjudicate guilty, or if it's just a misdemeanor and they get, you know, 40, 35, 30, 13 probation, that they can get that expunged. Um, and that means that they don't have to tell employers about it necessarily. But because this commission's work serves a law enforcement purpose per that state statute, um, we um, do look at the information even when it is expunged, much like other law enforcement agencies would um, in, in that context. Um, so um, it, it is unique and confusing perhaps, but um, uh, it, is, um, it is us doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I just I share the same frustration as the other commissioners, and we're going to look at it anyway. So I guess I'm I'm trying to understand the importance of asking for that information up front. And Mr. Boyd, today you're still. Mr. Boyd, today you are on probation, right? Yes, sir. You're still mailing in your yes, sir certificate or your letter saying that you're in compliance. You haven't moved. You're still at your same job, whatever, right? Yes, sir. To your probation officer. Yes, sir. And in fact, this offense is not going to get expunged, is it? No, sir. So this is not a question about expungement. This is a question about reporting a current conviction of which you're on probation for. Yes, sir. In March of this year for your application. Yes, sir. All right. I just want to make sure we weren't getting confused here about what's been expunged, not expunged, or could be expunged or shouldn't be expunged. But, uh, While we're all expressing aggravation, I, I, I do still have to um, kind of lean back on, on, on past practices and that once we identify that uh, we, we know what the count is, it is not a disqualifying account. I don't, uh, while I think we should address it, um, Mr. Fields, you've had expressed with even with this being reported, it does not disqualify him, correct? Well, from a, the ordinance itself has some very specific language about disqualifiers. Most of those disqualifiers are of felony nature. There is a section that, uh, that, that says, and it follows this language, any applicant shall, in addition to any disqualification, disqualification list anywhere else in this chapter, be disqualified if, and it goes through a series, uh, beginning with one, and it has, beginning with, uh, been convicted, pled guilty, no low contendere, uh, placed on judicial diversion, and so forth of the following things. And, but then it also goes to number three, that says has been convicted uh, for prior two years of application of any violation of this, but then it says in number four has failed to disclose any criminal conviction except traffic citations on the application. If this refers back to any any of the listed ones, then it would not be a disqualifier. But if this if any means any, and I'm not trying to you know parse a word then it may be that he actually is disqualified for failing to list a criminal 
because typically we're dealing with felonies, but a misdemeanor is a crime, uh, and I'll defer back to lawyers on that issue. Ms. Costonas, could you enlighten us a little more, please? Um, so I'm not sure I have a clearer answer than Mr. Fields just gave. I mean, it is not on the specific list of items that is within paragraph um, one of 674 120, um, which are homicide, rape, aggravated assault, kidnapping, robbery, burglary, domestic assault or domestic violence, child sex abuse, any sex related offense, leaving the scene of an accident, criminal solicitation, or criminal attempt to commit any of the above, perjury or false swearing in making any statement under oath in connection with the application for a driver's permit, or the felony possession, sale, or distribution of narcotic drugs or controlled substances. Um, and, um, If at the, and then it says, if, and two says, if at the time of the application, the applicant is charged with any offenses in one above, consideration of the application shall be deferred until an entry of a plea, conviction, acquittal, dismissal, or other final disposition of the charges. Um, if they've been convicted for a period of two years prior to the date of the application or violation of two or more sections of this code or other ordinances governing the operation of vehicles for hire, that's also disqualifying. And finally, the language Mr. Fields was referencing, if the driver of applicants has failed to disclose any criminal conviction, except traffic citations on the application for a permit. So I, I'm not a criminal defense attorney. Um, I, I know um, uh, our uh, vice commission, vice chair is one. Um, and uh, I, I'm not sure I understand um, as well as he does the, the current situation um, with Mr. Boyd's um, probation. Mr. Boyd's on 11 months, 29 days probation, starting, I guess, December of 2022. Yes, sir. He'll be on probation and reporting to a probation officer either by mail or in person, if required to, yes, sir. until December of 2023. Yes, sir. He, if he violates probation in any way, he'll have 11 months, 29 days to serve in, is it the Williamson County Jail? 20%, but yes. Well, you may be eligible for 20% early red release eligibility date. There's no guarantees necessarily. It's okay. I won't be going to jail no time soon. But if he tests positive for marijuana or any other drug or CBD, I think in Williamson County would get him revoked for pro on his probation. Or if he gets arrested again for a theft of property, as he was in 2015, or for reckless driving, as he was in two 2015. Which were dismissed. Yeah, he's very likely to have his probation violated and be serving 11 months, 29 days in the county jail. 100%. So my additional question, and I apologize for using the vice chair as an expert witness here. Um, but, I was asking questions. Yeah. <laughs> and Mr. Boyd just said he agreed 100%. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the current probation that he's on, the 11-29 probation, is if that's pursuant to 4035-313? It is not. It is not. You are so not you under diversion plead. or or expunge. Or you cannot get expunged at the end of your probation. You are not under judicial diversion, are you? Not at all. No. Okay. And list. So I you did either plead expunged. guilty or were adjudicated convicted of misdemeanor possession. Yes, I pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then it does seem to me that the four refers to criminal conviction, mm -hmm. so that that could arguably apply. And the, the portion at the end, though, failing to disclose on the application is that would essentially be falsifying a government application for a permit. And, I, and it could be an honest mistake, right? And it, it was. It, it's, it's okay. <laughs> you know, supposedly you're asked by staff, and it's it's really clearly written, it appears to me, on the on the application. Um, so it could be a mistake or it could have been a mistake. It was a totally a mistake on my end. Like I said, when they told me, they even called me and they said, hey, D'Angelo, you totally missed this whole excuse me, I did not know that I needed to write everything about my whole past life that I thought I dismissed on this piece of paper. So like I said, I apologize. And so the one thing that I do still have on there, yes, we will call me incompetent for not putting it on there. I apologize once again. You're talking to a kid that just want to drive. I just want to stay out the way. I just want to stay out of trouble. That's why we did. That's why we put in the application in the first place. Who's we? Me, D'Angelo. Okay. I represent my family. Mr. D'Angelo, um, you did have a matter in 2015 where you charged with theft of property under $500, right? Yes, yes right. I did. What was stolen? Um, we were actually in a car and this girl left her purse 
and she reported it stolen, and that's what happened. I was in the car with four other people. They charged all of us. And I'm you... from Memphis, Tennessee, so it's a place where things just happen, and you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. Okay. There's a couple of those charges on there, but I'd like to get in depth with those. Now, were you also charged at the same time with reckless driving in... In 2015? 2015, probably younger me, just got out of high school, Nissan, just, 100%. Just, just yes or no? 100%. Okay. And the reckless driving, you say, was dismissed, right? 100%, yes, sir. Okay. The theft of the property, you must have entered a guilty plea because that's the one you were put I on. I did it to oh, Hold on, let me finish, yes, okay? That's the one that you were actually uh, entered a conditional guilty plea and placed on the judicial diversion we've talked about here, 40, 35, 313. Yes, sir. And I guess you completed your probation successfully? Yes, sir. And it got expunged? Yes, sir. All right. So you did a conditional guilty plea to that charge? Yes, sir. All right. Which is why you're not going to be eligible for expungement on this current offense. And it's why you were not eligible for expungement on your current offense in Williamson County for possession of marijuana. That I do know, sir. I'm 100% yeah. aware of that. Everything, okay. like I said, as I've stated since the beginning, every charge before the last charge that I've had has been eligible for expungement and is still eligible for expungement. I just haven't gotten a chance to take care of it. But your Williamson County one is not going to be eligible for expungement. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. It's just a misdemeanor, and that would be the only just, charge on my record. I'm just trying to make sure we don't confuse apples and oranges here. Understood. Someday you may get your Memphis theft conviction, which is interesting. That has not been expunged yet, has it? No, sir. So there is a current conviction in Memphis for, until against you, you for into, theft of, of misdemeanor theft. Until you walk into the office and pay $75 for every single okay. charge that no, you have. Yeah, yes or no, do rent. you currently have a conviction out of Shelby County for theft under $500? Yes or no? If it pops up, yes, sir. No. Yes or no, do you or do you not? I say yes, sir. Okay. And so that also wasn't reported on the application, was it? Excuse me? That was not reported on the application either, was it? I don't it? think anything was reported until I put everything on the second application if we've been through this already. So on your first application in March of this year, you did not put down on both the first convictions, did you? There was nothing put on the application, because I think everybody knows that. That's why I ended up Are you enjoying this, this kind of arguing with me about this? Man, look, God is good to me, man. It's my girlfriend's birthday. I'm just trying to get to my girlfriend, so. Your decision is your decision. If you want to pass it or you want to wrap it up, it's cool with me. <laughs> Light, everything's cool with you. God is good, man. It's okay. Mr. Fielder, Ms. Costonis, I, I know this has come across us before, and have we in the past used this, uh, this particular, um, disposition on any of the other cases that we came across like this do you do you know if you have on, denied based on failure to give information on applications in this in this commission and again what happens if they're denied by you they have to wait 90 days to uh, reapply then they'd reapply and they would have another hearing with you and you would have the opportunity to approve them Doing that reapplication, basically the process is to give them a chance to again fill out this application, be truthful to everything, and then that would that have them come before us again, or or if there were no findings that were not on the application, the application would go forward. No, it would. Any time there's a hearing that you deny, always comes back to you as automatic re referral. If you take an action, I'm not going to countermand it. I can elaborate a little bit more on the, the specific confusion we had on the question of the judicial diversion. Um, so with, with the judicial diversion process, which is often used for misdemeanor um, uh, types of issues, um, uh, if you serve your 11 months and 29 days of probation flawlessly, or sometimes it's actually less than that, um, uh, you meet all your conditions of probation, um, the final adjudication of that is actually dismissed. I'm looking at Pat to make sure I'm right about this, um, as opposed to um, a, a conviction. Um, so if it is under 4035-313, um, that is actually referenced in C1, um, which is the list of the um, homicide, rape, aggregated assault, kidnapping, da 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 um, But it is not referenced in, in Section 4, I would say, because Section 4 says, a criminal conviction. So I think if your criminal 
charges are dismissed, you do not have a criminal conviction on your record. But as of right now, Mr. Boyd has not gone back to court to get it dismissed. Expunged. Okay. Everything is dismissed. Well, right now it's showing just a theft under five hundred dollars under judicial well, yeah, that's diversion. That's the only thing. Yes, sir. That thing will Which not is, be dismissed. It's not dismissed. It won't be dismissed. No. It won't be expunged. And the fact that you picked up new charges may keep it from being dismissed. I have one charge. I have one All charge. Right, the, new, the new conviction, correct? Yes, that's it. So there's a lot of ifs still on his case as to whether he'll ever get that theft case uh, expunged, dismissed and then expunged. It'll so. be expunged. What we've done in the past sometimes, uh, Commissioner Carr, sometimes in the past we have denied it so that they had to go back, reapply, do it correctly, and also pay a new, a new application. So fee, I've correct? already done that. Sir, he'll call if he needs, a, needs anything. Just wait till he asks you a question, please. So there's also sort of a penalty in having to pay for the new application fee. When, when I deny the application, they'll automatically go back if they choose because the application becomes void. It's mm -hmm. null once I did and then they have, they have the right to appeal to the commission that it creates the new application. Which is what I did. And I paid two $75 background checks, so. Which only cost $35 at the background place. Well, I mean, we're not actually here to debate the, the cost. I think the problem arises is the fact that if it, you know, if it costs three seventy-five dollar background checks, this is not going to be considered correct until all the charges are placed on it before it comes before us. I think that's what I'm saying. The second application that I did, I literally wrote down every single last charge that you guys are all looking at on this piece of paper. So I'm not sure if you guys are looking at the new application or not. But I've already any time they any time they reapply, what happens? We give them a copy if they choose a copy of their and they they then create uh, a new application. What you're what you're seeing, what I'm seeing, and this is the original application. The second application would have everything on it if he and and they do. They set the front counter typically and write it, but we give them a copy. They sign for it and go through all the proper procedures that we have with the TBI. And when you say you give them a copy, you're giving them a copy of the criminal record. Correct. Right. And I sat there for 35 <clears throat> minutes copying everything from my criminal record to the new application. For record, this is the original application because I see here it says zero. Correct. This is then what you show him after the fact that you pulled well, up from TBI you're, records. You're actually, that's an MVR. What we would then give him is oh, this, so this page, page that looks like wrong this. Page. This would be the back, this is what he would have been given a copy of. Right. And it's, and, and, and it's circled. I would um, caution the showing of those documents on camera because those are confidential. That's true. Oh, sorry, apologize. Uh, I just, I just want to make sure that we're seeing what he saw and turned in as an original and as a second copy. That was my, so to make sure that this, the, the, the form that we have that has this zero on it that is indicating uh, to Mr. D'Angelo that, or Mr. D'Angelo is indicating to us that there are zero charges and then the previous or the or the copy behind it uh, which looks like it has some handwritten uh, things here at the bottom uh, 22 22 possession of drugs Those would be my notes in the denial my denial notes correct so what so what initially we would need is a copy handwritten from him with all of this on here and not uh, this indication of a zero on it. This is what the second application would have been. You see the twirl? So this is the difference. Okay, so 
That one I don't. No, we would we, we we just don't du duplicate it. We send you the criminal background as well as the initial. Okay, gotcha. But you did receive this one at, on the second yes. time. Yes. Okay. So what Mr. Fields has indicated to me is there was a second copy filled out that we, I did not have present in front of me. Um, and you're indicating that you did pay the fee twice. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, and so that you do have a, mm -hmm. a form that's filled out correctly. <coughs> and that other than if this original form had not been filled out incorrectly, would have passed. We would, well, we would have reviewed it with all the information on it. And if you would have reviewed it, if we would have reviewed it and he qualified, then he would not be here today. Okay. So if you had to review the second one that you filled out, would you, would that have come before us, or would that if, have been if approved? It passed, again, if it passed, this particular it's a little more challenging to do it right this minute. Um, what we would have done is is gone through it. We would have compared it. We would have checked the probation to see where how that fit in with the ordinance, uh, and then if there were any questions that we had, we would contact the courts. Whatever. My guess is just looking at it, he pray probably would have qualified, other than he failed to fully disclose. Would you not have brought it to our attention that he had a? They was on misdemeanor probation for possession of a controlled substance and for our concern that we might want to make a, a condition, if, if he were approved, to be a condition that he uh, have drug testing? Probation typically, at least in the ordinance previous, has always been related to the felony charges that are mm -hmm. listed in the ordinance. Uh, it could be a, a rule that the commission could certainly explore, uh, assuming that it would be legal, but that would be a different issue that we'd have to do research on, and it might be more challenging. But no, it, the probation is always referring to, uh, in this case, we're referring to a, a felony. In, th in this case, the problem is he just, it, the, the, the not listing uh, the, the issues. I'm just concerned about somebody who a few months earlier, a few months before his application has been convicted of possession of a controlled substance, presumably for use, um, and whether we would want to be aware of that before we issued a permit. The last time an issue like this came before the commission, this has been several years ago, we had the issue of domestic violence. You, had, you said that you wanted to see any charge of domestic violence. We went back to the Metropolitan Council and asked them to amend the ordinance to add the word any. If, if for instance, today you would like for the council to consider uh, any drug charges or, or certain specific language we would be we certainly could go back to the council to ask them to review and revise uh, and if they chose to do so then you could enforce yeah. the felony it, it speaks specifically to felony possession sale uh, distribution of narcotic drugs or controlled substances so it would have to add language that or delete language, correct. Felony. Yeah. Well, I'm not as concerned about whether they're a felon or not. It's just the, I'm concerned about someone being issued a permit who might be a habitual user of a controlled substance, whether misdemeanor or felony. Well, we've had Mr. Boyd up here for quite a while on his feet, so... Um, Mr. Boyd's okay. Our, Mr. Uh, Boyd just won a cup of water. Okay. Um, I'm just playing there. Do we have any other questions, concerns, discussion? If not, um, I guess it's time for a motion. I'd like to make a motion with a condition. Uh, I'm sure we're all concerned um, that just a few months prior to your application, there was an issue of candor or honesty. Uh, f whether you forgot it or not forgot it, it, it still comes across as that condition. There's also the condition of a lot of issues of, um, you know, theft and, and possession. I know you said it was CBD, but 
we aren't there, we aren't in the car. What, what we see is what we have to consider. Understood. And, and, and given that in front of us, I think we would all be more comfortable to know, to want to know that, that during your probationary period mm -hmm. that uh, there was no relapse or no other incident gotcha. uh, while you were driving. So I would like to make, if I could, a motion to approve um, with uh, drug testing, um, a report of drug testing back to the council uh, before the probationary period is up. You're effectively putting him on probation as well. Yes. Cool. <laughs> for what period of time on the probation? I'm, I'm sorry. I guess for the for it to run concurrent with his same 1129 probationary period. So for a period of a year. It would probably make you could run it to the next renewal period. If okay. You want. Yes, to the, the next, next renewal, renewal period. Be next spring. Okay, till next spring. So, one drug so, test, two drug. I mean, just just a, a random drug a test random, between now and then. A random drug yes, test sir. between now and then. All right. Do I need to restate that, or was that at, too? at whose cost? Historically, it's always been um, to the right. applicant. I mean, yeah. to the I applicant's just, I think cost. Of course, yeah, we're motion. not. Yeah. yeah. So. I'm going to restate it. I would like to make a motion to approve with the condition of a random drug test at the applicant, Mr. Uh, D'Angelo Boyd, uh, at some period between now and renewal uh, to keep his status as satisfied. I appreciate it. I'll second. All right, there's a motion on the table. It's been a second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Opposed. Nay. Opposed. Two opposed. One, two, three, four, four eyes. Four eyes, two opposed. Okay. Your application's been approved. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to personally say I want you all to have a blessed rest of your day. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I do need to call one thing to the commission's attention. Uh, the Metro Council has a uh, working session in here at 4 o'clock. We've been asked to, to vacate by 3.15. I don't know if we can make it harder than that, but we may need to move judiciously. <laughs> Mr. Fields, up next up on our agenda is Adam Merce Mercado Ferrar. Mr. Ferrar? In, in uh, making his application, he listed a speeding ticket during the last 10 years. Uh, he failed to disclose uh, charges in 2000, uh, including domestic charges, operating vehicle while intoxicated, uh, domestic violence in 2004, domestic violence in 2008, operating a vehicle again intoxicated in 2010, a 2017 domestic uh, uh, charge. Many of them were dismissed, but they were not listed. Mr. Fields, do I have this correct at 2004 domestic violence, a 2008 domestic violence, a 2010 DUI, and what was the other DUI? Um, a 2000 and 2010. So in 2000, a DUI. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not 2005? Well, it was lengthy. Uh, We've got one in 2000 that ended up being done in 2001. Uh, domestic violence in uh, uh, 2004. Uh, you had an assault in 2005 that could have, no, that would have been, a, that could have carried over from there, could have been pled down. Uh, there's a DUI. Mr. Pyle is correct. 2005, there is a operating while intoxicated and or impaired. Basically, what you're looking at, he, he disclosed none, very similar to our previous case. I also noticed a 2000 uh, domestic violence, very first thing mm -hmm. on the TBI sheet. It says convicted. Well, that's, a, that's a disorderly person. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Ricardo Ferrara, am I pronouncing your name correct? Yes, sir. Uh, so you seem to be able to remember a speeding ticket to put down in your application from 10 years ago. How'd you forget the more important offenses like driving under the influence and domestic violence, considering you're applying for a permit to operate a vehicle for the public, to transport, transport the public? I went to um, counseling, a program, and um, to be a better person. And because it happened many years ago, I didn't remember the exact days. Well, that didn't seem to be a problem with your speeding ticket because you put down there over 10 years ago. It didn't, didn't have to be the exact date there. We're, we're glad you reported the speeding ticket, but I think I've been more interested in your driving, the charges of driving under the influence and domestic violence, assault. How long ago was your last conviction? How long ago? Yeah. Probably about eight years ago. And what was that for? Um, my ex-wife claimed that I pushed my son. I just called his attention and he called her and she come and pick him up and called me the police and claiming that I pushed him. What was the outcome of the case? I got put on probation. Okay. So you got convicted of domestic violence about eight years ago? Um, I plead guilty. You pl yeah. Okay, you pled guilty to domestic violence about eight years ago. I don't remember exactly the charges because it was many years ago. When I asked you about your last conviction, you seemed to have a pretty good recollection of, of the events that occurred and that you were, that you pled guilty. So again, how'd you forget to put it down on this report, this application? I made a mistake not putting it down, but um, when they asked me the dates, I didn't remember the dates. I still don't remember the dates. But you remember the incident? Yes, sir. So, just for on record, in case anybody's watching out in TV land and you're going to come down here, doesn't, we're, 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 we're not concerned if you remember that it was July the 12th at 9.15 and you were on Gay Street. It, put the, con I got a speeding ticket in August, somewhere between August of 1990 I, I probably got three that year august june where we it, we are more concerned with that you are out here serving the public in a safety related capacity and that we this council trust us to protect the public to say hey you know we're you're you're putting people on the road that have drug possession charges that have DUIs, that have assault charges, that could possibly assault the public again, that could possibly have a passenger in his, co his car and you guys knew he had seven DUIs, he didn't even tell you, and he hit someone on the sidewalk on Broadway and killed them. The, the, the issue is we have to be able to consider the public safety according to your background. If you're not honest about it, to put it here, it makes it hard for us to discern where we feel like you're safe enough to be on the road. Yes, so it, it's not the concern of if you remember the exact day, that if you, that you put it on here to give us a chance to take the consideration of 
public safety <clears throat> for which we're here for. I just wanted to put that out there for anybody else that might come down here. Mr. Ricardo Ferrara, I just counted up 10 pages of criminal record. And the only thing you put down was the least serious offense, and that's a speeding ticket. I didn't have a chance before today to go through your entire 10 pages of your criminal record, but I noticed on here that you were also charged with robbery. You remember that, don't you? Yes, sir. And you were charged with possession of a handgun. Let's see here. Possession with a weapon, handgun, firearm, third degree. You remember that, don't you? Yes, I was with a person that committed a robbery. Hold on. It wasn't me. Oh, okay. You're also charged with another offense of criminal possession of a firearm, fourth, third degree, fourth and third degree, different offenses. What was the outcome of your robbery conviction, of your robbery charge? I went to a camp, minimum security for a few months, then they gave me work release, and then um, I got released my normal life. And were you convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor? I was on the race at the time. So um, I don't really, that was 30 years ago, probably more. Mm -hmm. And um, I was with a person that I have an arm and um, I plead guilty on court and then um, he went to trial, blame it on me. And the witness, um, he said that it wasn't me, but for me to be in on location with him, I was um, charged too. Well, it's interesting that the record is showing that you pled guilty to attempted, uh, attempted robbery. Do you remember that? Yes. Well, then what? How are you remembering these things today, but you don't remember them when you're filling out your application? That, 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 that's just being redundant. That just doesn't make sense to me. This is a very serious charge, attempted committed robbery. Yes, sir. That you served time on. And you were living in New York City at the time? Yes, sir. The Bronx? Yes. Ms. Costones, could you refresh my memory on the statute of limitation on the felony, on, on what the time period of, of us to consider felonies when considering an application? For, di for disqualification yes, of these five um, years. So 674-120-C1 um, says that um, the applicant shall be disqualified if the applicant has been convicted, pleaded guilty, no low contendere, placed on judicial diversion pursuant to Tennessee Code Annotated Section 4035.313, or been released from incarceration, probation, or parole within a period of seven years prior to the date of the application for violation of any of the following criminal offenses under the laws of Tennessee, any other state, or the United States of America. And those offenses are homicide, rape, aggravated assault, kidnapping, robbery, burglary, domestic assault or domestic violence, child sexual abuse, any sex-related offense, leaving the scene of an accident, criminal solicitation or criminal to attempt to commit any of the above, perjury or false swearing and making a statement under oath in connection with the application for a driver's permit or the felony possession, sale or distribution of narcotic drugs or controlled substances. So all those last multitude of offenses, that falls within the seven year, or is that exception to? So um, if, if he was released from probation or parole um, from a, a conviction for one of those um, uh, offenses um, within seven years prior to the date of the application, then he would be disqualified. I, I think they're all older than that. Yeah, they are. It's just the failure to report them. And every once in a while, they'll come up here and we'll find out that they, they fall within that seven years and they, they you know, and we just have, we just tell them we have to deny it and they can come back and whenever they get that seven year period of time. 
No, this, this one's just failure to re report anything else other than a speeding ticket. Okay. You know, I, if, if I thought this would have general deterrence, I would start recommending that we deny these, but to deny these if I thought it would improve the, the, the honesty and the disclosure. Candidly, I've got to tell you, I think you just wanted us to know the one that you weren't afraid of us denying your application on and didn't put all the rest of them down there. Because you're sure remembering them today without any difficulty. But I'm not a big believer in general deterrence, so. Unless there's other questions or other. I've got one other question okay. for Ms. Costona. The DUIs, do they fall within a different category? Uh, yes, there is another provision about that. Hang on just one second. Let me get back into my code. Do you remember the way that is, Billy? It's uh, just above the left hand. No, go ahead. More above? Mm -hmm. Oops. That section right there. That's within the last five years. Um, no convictions in the last five years for any of the following offenses involving bodily injury or death, and no convictions in the last three years for any of the following offenses not involving injury or death. Hit and run, driving under the influence of an alcoholic beverage or drug, and reckless driving. So it all Mr. Fields and Ms. Costonis, I think it, we are able to look at a person's criminal record and make a decision whether we think they're a fit person to be given a permit. And there's times when Mr. Fields has brought someone with a very lengthy and serious record before us, and we've questioned the individual to make sure that we are protecting the public and that they are a fit individual for operating a vehicle or hired by the public. But in the interest of getting out of here by 3 o'clock, um, yeah. is there any other discussion or questions? And if not, does somebody want to make a motion one way or the other? Move to den I'll move to deny the application based on failure to adequately file the application. And list all the... Um, criminal record. Is there a second? Second. All right, there's a motion on the table. Any further discussion? All right, the motion is to deny the application. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Um, your, per your application has been denied. Mr. Fields, if I understand what you said, he could reapply in 90 days. 90 days. Okay. All right. Bruce D. Johnson with a company application for Nashville Transportation. Is that right? Uh-huh. Okay. Mr. Fields, can you enlighten us? Yes. In making his application, he actually had some disclosures. He had disclosed that... Uh, uh, that uh, a 2004 uh, drug charge uh, had a 2013 probation violation, but uh, he did list that. Uh, he's, you know, prior to that, it was many times going back to age 21. So uh, what I could not find was, uh, they're actually pretty far back, was 2002 and 2001, assault charges 2001 and 2002, promoting prostitution. Otherwise, he would be qualified. But he, he, did, he did make effort uh, to uh, disclose. And I want to add this about probation violations. I am fully understanding why someone might not think that that falls under the criteria that's in this paragraph, because having represented some folks who have had probation violations, it, while you get arrested, you go to jail, if your probation officer insists on you going to jail, it does not feel like a new charge. It doesn't look like a new charge. It doesn't smell like a new charge. And in fact, it's under the same old case number. 
when you go to court. It's more of a, it's more of a situation that's occurred while on probation, um, rather than having the sense or the feeling of a brand new criminal case. So, Mr. Johnson, am I stating that correctly? Well, I'd like to speak to that. It's a complicated situation because in 2000, I got convicted for promoting prostitution because I used to be a manager of the strip clubs back in the day. I completed that probation. And so I was on probation for, um, for something that happened in 2004. So I completed my probation. But what happened was in 2013, they changed the law. And so they were trying to get me to uh, register as a sex offender for something that happened in 2000, and I refused to do that. So that's why they tried to uh, uh, fail me for a uh, probation violation. But when I went to court, the judge said, you can't do this. He's completed his probation. So they kicked it out. So I completed my probation. They couldn't violate. They charged me for that, but they couldn't convict me of that because I completed it because they tried to go back in 12 years later and do something, and I refused to do that. So you won your probation violation Absolutely. Uh, warrant? Absolutely. Yeah. And then the other thing is, I think what's unfair is that I'm 61 years old. I couldn't remember half of that stuff. So if they allow us to pay $75, get the information, <laughs> and then put it on there, it's a different story. <laughs> you know, because I put on there, I'm not sure, because I wasn't, you know. But if they allow us to pay first, get that information, then if you don't disclose it, that's a different story. But I just didn't remember. I think Mr. Fields was trying to say that earlier when he mentioned that you did put on there. Prior to that, it was many times going back to the age of 21. So yeah, I, I, just I, didn't I think know. he was giving you credit on that. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, so I did the $75 a year. You know? I, but I, I think that that would help out a lot if you could just pay the $75, get the information, list it. Then we, Ms. Wouldn't, Ms. Then we wouldn't have a way of testing your honesty. Well, that's up to character. Or your memory. You know. uh, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. There is nothing stopping anyone from pulling their criminal record, is there not? I've only lived in Davidson County. Uh, and no, they've not had any charge. They go to the Davidson County Criminal Court Clerk's Office and get that. Or they could go to the fingerprints. The, the young man earlier was questioning our charges. Uh, what he fails to understand is we spend a lot of time looking at this. So the, while the fee is not the full 75, staff time on this, uh, if we charge the true rate, and uh, we do not want an evaluation that the rate will go up. Because right. we spend for, you know, if we're calculating it out every 30 minutes or every hour, then take an hourly rate based on salary, benefits, lights, the whole works. So, Well, Mr. McNally, to your your line of or your train of thought earlier that that might be something good to place on the application that that we suggest that you might go pull your criminal record before you fill this application <laughs> out oftentimes if someone says i've got a whole lot we will say you might want to go find it sometimes employers can run employer hr packages have where they can't necessarily run what we run, but they can run and get a, uh, a, a, a fair assessment, especially if they've only lived in one state or one county. Ms. Costonis, would that not, just to be careful, that would not fall under legal advice, would it? No. I'm, I'm sorry, would what fall under legal advice? Uh, suggesting that they go pull their criminal oh, background. Oh, well, giving them legal advice. I mean, <laughs> I think just if it was just a statement to the effect that, they, that you have the ability um, to obtain your record, you know, if, you're, if your memory of past offenses is not clear. Um, uh, you know, I think that as, as long as we're just making the statement to say, we need you to be honest about this, we need you to include everything, and you have the right to get this, this record on your own history um, prior to filling this out if you wish to. Um, but it doesn't, um, like if, if we said we recommend it, that's kind of maybe veering into the advice category. But I think as long as we um, we say it in a you know a statement of fact kind of way, um, then that would be fine. I'm just trying to stay in my field, Mr. McNally. I didn't <laughs> study and pay all the money you did to get your <laughs> legal degree. So I'm just trying to stay in my lane to make sure we're not giving legal advice. And once complete, we do give them, if they request, and they'll sign the appropriate documents, we do give them copies of it 
for future efforts. Mr. Chair, question. Yes. Can, can, we, can we not amend the application to not recommend, maybe suggest? I mean, we're spending a heck of a lot of time talking about this, which if we gave them better, clear, more clear direction, we may avoid a lot of these conversations. We, we could certainly put it in writing. And, and we, have, we have wrestled with this for the 12 years I've been on this uh, commission, and we have tweaked the language. But the majority of the time, the folks come up, they know what expungement means. They know what conviction means. They know what arrest means. They just don't put it down there. Mr. Johnson, to his credit, said, I know what it means. <laughs> I just can't remember it all. And he wrote that basically. Yeah, so I, I think we've done everything we can. It may, maybe, maybe something in writing on there that says, if you're having difficulty remembering your record, we, we recommend you go. Yeah, we, we recommend could, you go get your criminal record. And we could put a sign on well, the wall. Not, not recommend, but. Please know that you can. Yeah, you, yeah. Do yeah, we yeah. need to do anything to make that happen? I actually think that would help. No, but the ordinance allows the director to develop the, there are certain things the ordinance requires, but we can put additional information on. We'll speak with our, our policy <laughs> advisor. <laughs> and maybe highlight that. We could do that too. Unless that's not a commercial copy. Mr. Johns, just for my own clarification, the uh, 2013 charge out of Rutherford County uh, says, huh? 13. Yeah, 2000, September 13, 2013, Bruce Demetrius Johnson uh, says violation of probation, CC felony. Is that the one you were yeah, talking that, about just a few yeah, moments ago? Was, yeah. yeah, I just want to make sure because it said felony, but it's really probation violation. Right. So. Yeah, that was dismissed. Because, okay. And actually, they just did it on the day that I, my probation took, was terminated. And so I was just like, are you serious? And so when I look through here, it looks like 2004 was your felony pose possession conviction. Yeah. And then some things in California, Los Angeles, and that's it? Yeah. All right. Any other questions or concerns? Uh, and if not, are we ready for a motion? I'll move that we accept the application, approve the application, excuse I me. I second. All right, it's a motion on the table. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ms. Johnson, your, per your application's been approved. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for your candor on your application. Amen. Yeah. And your recommendation to us. <laughs> <laughs> we may call that the Johnson recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving right along. Um, Pierre Townsend. Mr. Fields, can you enlighten us about Mr. Townsend's application? Mr. Townsend made application uh, to be a uh, OPVH driver in making his application. Uh, he said no under how many times you've been given a ticket and then listen, nothing that I know of as he, after he did his, uh, uh, after he did his fingerprints, he came back in 2005 on a controlled substance sale, cocaine, half G plus. Uh, evading arrest, uh, the evading was dismissed, the, there was another evading that apparently pled guilty to, then there was a driver's license guilty plea, um, and then in 2004 there was another driver's license, but typically we don't, in 1990 had larceny charges that uh, was guilty, so there were, uh, you know, three times he failed to list, they're all 19 years, well, 18 years plus old. All of them? <clears throat> yeah, the last charge has 2005. Mr. Fields, looking at the uh, record, what page is the uh, cocaine of a half gram or more on? Uh, on page one, at the very page bottom. Page one? Of, of the TBI? Yes. Okay. At, at the bottom of the page. That's a 2005 one? Yes, sir. Unknown. 
I don't see a disposition on the cocaine case. Is what I was looking for. Yeah. Well, that's what it is. Mr. Townsend. Yes. Two thousand. I, I saw your answer there. Nothing that I know of. Um, it's pretty weak, but uh, that's just my expression of my opinion, subjective there. But uh, the 2005 uh, controlled substance where you were charged with uh, cocaine, half a gram or more, what was the outcome of that case? Tell you the truth, sir, I don't really know. Uh, I don't even remember probation or nothing for on that case. Okay, thank you. Well, let's see. Your date of, is your date of birth February 28th, 1961? 27th. The 27th? Yes. Well, how about that? I have my ID if you'd like to see. No, I, I, I take your word for that on that one. It's off by a day there. Um, you were charged with possession of cocaine in Davidson County, though? Yes, sir. All right, you do remember that? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and it looks like you appeared in front of Judge Evans, which would have been a female judge, um, and that you were represented by a member of the Public Defender's Office, Amy Goodwin. Mm-hmm. You remember that? No. Oh, I just wondered when you said, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, from the looks of this, uh, you pled guilty to a lesser charge, probably the... Position, possession or casual exchange of the cocaine. It would have been probably put on 11 months, 20... Well, you were on 11 months, 29 days probation. Um, actually, I, I may take that back. It looks like you got 11 months, 29 days, and it says suspended, no. Work release, no. I don't see any probation on it either. No. Did you go to jail? No. That's why it's some stuff on my record I don't understand myself, but... Is your spelling your first name P-I-E-R-R-E? -E? Yes, sir. Last name T-O-W-N-S-E-N-D? Yes, sir. I'm just reading the uh, Davidson County Criminal Court record here on you. Um, and it indicates 11 months, 29 days. You were charged with a felony controlled substance says it was reduced to a guilty, there was a guilty plea to a lesser charge, which, was it a small amount of cocaine? It had to be, if, if, if I was charged with, it had to be a small, I, I didn't have a large amount. I remember going to jail for a large amount of cocaine. I didn't, I didn't deal with cocaine like that. I was, I just at that point in time, uh, I got caught with some drugs, and that was the first time. And if you look at my record, that's the last time. Don't remember going to jail. It's been so long, sir. I I, I remember be, being in jail for child support and and maybe for that, but I just I hadn't been in jail like twice. All right, so there's a possibility you went to jail it's for a possibility. this. Possibility. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fields. Anybody else have any questions or try to clarify? Or... Have you ever had any testing done that would look at your memory? And I and I, and I, I want to be sensitive with the question. I mean, look, I, I forget plenty of things with my uh, uh, as I've gotten older, right? Like names. I would think that that jail. I'm better with faces than I am with names. Yeah, I just think that forgetting that you went to jail is all. Is a, is all. Like it's I, been I, so long, sir. You know, it's been a while. It's been, it was over 18 years. Are you telling us 
that you don't remember why you went to jail, but you do but remember going to jail. It's on in my on my post on my arrest record. It says that I was that I was charged with possession of cocaine. So I had to have got arrested. And I had to go to jail if I if it, and but I for me to remember exactly how the search the situation I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember the probation. I'm. I'm I have been on probation before, and it could have been. It could have been for that. Well, it looks like back in 1995 you were on probation, um, but you know this. This is a more recent thing, a recent case. So. What year? Well, in 1995 you appeared in front of Judge uh, Sadler, hmm. back when he used to be on the bench. Um, and you were charged with possession of marijuana under half an ounce at that time. You see, I, and it indicates that you completed the court process, which would indicate that you had probation and you completed it. Um, you had a court fine of $250, which is typical on a marijuana conviction. I didn't smoke marijuana, but it's a charge on my record. I take accountability for it. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, you clean off the drugs and everything? Yes, sir. What is it you want to do with this permit? I want to be able to drive other people. Uh, I'm looking at drive, trying to drive for Uber Blank. You want to drive an Uber Blank? Yes. OK. Uh, what kind of vehicle do you have? I don't have I don't. I don't I'm planning on working for someone else drive for someone else that has a fleet of vehicles. Who's that? I have to look in. I got to, it should be on, it, I don't TSC, satellite, communication. It should, it's in my, it's in my, my paperwork, the company I'm supposed to work it'll, for. It'll be on the first page of the application. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, did you go to them for the job, or did they come to you about driving for them? T T E S satellite communications. Yes, they. Uh, it was it's, it was mutual. Uh, you know, he was he had a fleet, and I asked him about it. And he told me to put in, put in an application to see if I can get my permit. Have you ever driven for the public before? Yes. And in what way? I drove truck for a stationary distributing company. That was back in. Back in 84, 85, th that, them years. 1984, 1985? Yes. Okay. Uh, and and uh, my father had a had a tie company, A1 Tie Services, and we used to, I used to drive, do service. I worked for him for a long time, doing service calls. So we traveled all, we traveled all around the uh, Tennessee area. I noticed a long time ago you had some driving on suspended license and a couple incidents. Yes, sir. What's your driving record in the last uh, five, seven years? In the in the in the report, I had two uh, incidents, and and uh, that's the only thing that I know of. That's when I pulled up my record. When I went, I, I had to go and get the paperwork from DMV to mm -hmm. to tell me what was on my record and. For the last 10 years, I have nothing. His MBR indicates in the last three years, which is a period we look at as zero. Can I ask you what, what if you don't mind, what, what what's your occupation now? I don't have occupation. I'm unemployed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. There may be some other questions. All right. For the record, who are you? Frank Lyons, Tours. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? If not, is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. 
I'll second. All right, it's a motion on the table. It's been seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Are there? Okay, um, we have one pass. Any nays? All right, so one, two, three, four, five affirmatives and one pass. All right, um, Mr. Townsend, you, your application's been approved. So what's the next process? Mr. Fields will discuss that with you or his office, yeah, okay? Come back, come back to the office. Might want to give his call. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Fields, we're moving on to entertainment transportation driver applications. Clayton Arnold. Mr. Arnold, and he has the owner of the company with him. In making his application, he indicated zero, but in 2010, there was a DUI conviction. Um, that was uh, suspended after 48 hours, time served, public work, public service, and so forth. But 2010 failed to list. And this application feels kind of light. I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's the lightest one yet. So. Uh, you're and welcome. Not, again, not, so. <laughs> well, you might want to start with the apology for not reporting yes, it. I, you know? I, that is totally um, my fault, and I apologize for that. We're, we're grateful that it's light, but uh, we're not going to take. A DUI conviction that's not reported as light when you're asking for an application for a permit to transport the public. Yes, sir, I understand. So what happened? Why is it not in here? That was 2010. That was 13 years ago. I was under the impression that it was totally off my record. Yeah, anytime I'd been in a job interview or shopped around for car insurance, I would verbally you know, communicate that, but I would never put it down as far as uh, being concerned about a background check or anything like that. Um, it's nothing I'm not trying to hide. I'm not proud of it. And it's, whether it's on my record or not, it's something I still think about and live with. So. You said that you verbally communicate that. When you went into Mr. Field's office, did you tell him? You said you do it with insurance and buying cars. And did you to say, honest, hey, I, I mean, got I, this I DUI, really can't should I put this on here? It's been I 13 really can't years. Recall. That was, yeah, a lapse on my part. <laughs> I do have a question on your uh, motor vehicle record. Yes, sir. Uh, something happened on December 28, 2017. You're charged with speeding 86 in a 70 mile per hour zone. That I understand what that is. But then there's another charge here. It's IMP LOC in improper person in a HOV lane. Was that the other charge? Yes. Okay. Um, I was, that was Rutherford County yeah. and I was coming back on a Monday morning. It was after, between Christmas and New Year's and it was myself and my dog in the HOV lane. I pulled out to pass a guy and got busted. So, or pulled over, excuse me. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, concerns, expressions of opinions? If not, do we have a motion one way or the other? I second. All right, there's a motion on the table to approve Mr. Arnold's application. Uh, is there any further discussion? Just want to make sure you're never going to be in the HOP lane again. Alone. Only if I have somebody with it, it's It's really frustrating to those of us that are actually trying to communicate. I've to learned that the hard way, yes, sir. Thank you. Don't blame your dog. We <laughs> <laughs> love them, but they don't count. Or Rutherford County. Well, I would just like to state as the owner of the company, also we have, uh, we have updated our application process to include things like this on there. Um, we were under the interpretation that it's furnished with one kind of definition of if you're not. Um, so, our error on our end for employment has been corrected. So, you can't get a DUI expunged. Uh, I know that now. Yeah, it yes, stays sir. on your record forever because uh, they, it's an enhancing offense. If you got another DUI, then they're going to look back at the if it's within the time period, they're going to look back and you're going to look at 45 days in jail instead of the 48 hours. Yes, sir. Um, just so expungement. The, le the, the legislative policy behind the expungement statute 
actually says is to put the person back in the position they were before they were arrested. But it doesn't, it doesn't get there until you actually have it expunged. And DUI is one of those offenses that can never be expunged. There's a lot of other ones, too. But uh, appreciate you guys being careful about your, uh, your application process. We obtain an MVR. The MVR mm -hmm. only goes back 10 years. So this happened 13 years. Yeah. And they're not going to have other criminal convictions on them. So. All right. Did we? Yeah. All right. So there's motion on the table. It's been a second. No further discussion. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Application's been approved unanimously. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. You are? Okay. We, we yeah, still have to take care of it. Okay. Just make sure it's noted, okay. No, yeah, they just told me that. But he comes off tomorrow. Mr. Santa Stevens has to leave, <coughs> so we have one more person. Christopher We're Bell. Good. And is that a representative from your employer? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, in making his application, Mr. Uh, in making his application, he failed to list some charges. They are older charges. Uh, 1995, um, harassing communication, intimidation. They were retired. Uh, it looks like there may have been an additional charge of the same things. Uh, did have an aggravated assault in 1990 uh, that uh, he was convicted of. It was a, a misdemeanor. And uh, did have it in 84, contributing to the delinquency of a minor. But uh, in making his application, he listed zero. Again, the last charge, is, as I understand, is 1995. Well, Mr. Bell, you have the benefit of having heard and seen about seven, eight people before you. You better have a real good explanation for not revealing. You better have a believable one. Well, yeah, to be honest, um, I've had my Class A license since uh, 1984. I've drove tanker trucks. Uh, I've uh, did prison ministry. Uh, and as far as not putting anything on my application, I didn't think it'd go back further than 10 years. So that's exactly why I didn't put anything on my application, uh, you know, on my, on my paperwork, because there's nothing on there since 1995. And the uh, incident with contributing a link of a minor I had just graduated high school and got a bottle of Jack Daniels, which I didn't drink. And uh, <clears throat> my little brother and his little friend was at, my, at, at home. And I was the only oldest one there, and they was playing video games. And at that time, back in the 80s, we said, you want something to drink, just go get it. And he decided to grab the liquor bottle. And that's how that got on there. So. No, 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 that's not how that. How did, it, how did the police end up showing up inside the house Cause, and cause, finding the liquor bottle in your younger brother? No, no, no. The, the kid, the kid, we ended up having to take the kid to the hospital. So, oh. Yeah, because the kid. And when we ended up going to the court, it got kicked out because the kid and his parents, they let him drink. So, so uh, he had alcohol poisoning? Yes. Oh, my God. Did he? He was okay, though. No, no, he's fine. Okay. I knew there was a little bit more to that story. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the story. Now, the aggravated assault with a weapon that was reduced to a misdemeanor assault, and you were placed on, you, you actually served time of six months. What was that about? Uh, that was at my house. Somebody showed up at my, up at my house. It wasn't a weapon. Uh, well, if you want to call a change in my tire a weapon, guy came to my house uh, and started incident with me, and that's what I had, and I told him to get out of my face and get out of my yard, and... I just held it. I didn't actually hit the guy, but that's that's what that was. Yeah, the four-way lug nut wrench. So I still haven't heard why 
these things that you know about, other than you say, well, I didn't think anybody would find out because no, they were that's more than not, 10 years ago. Sir, that's not what I said. No, yeah, but you, what you did say was you what, thought what, they were more than 10 years ago, so they were all, all these incidents that, that's on, that you're talking about happened when I was young. Uh, I'm 58 years old. Uh, I'm a trainer. I, I train drivers. You know, um, I've that's, been... That, that's all fine and dandy, I'm, but it doesn't say... If they were old, don't put them down. It and says I, list, and, any and, and all. And I just explained to you, sir, why I didn't put them on there. Because I thought anything past 10 years was not, you know, was not irrelevant. Everybody here has a past. I'm, I'm not proud of what I did in my past, but that's exactly what it is. If everybody goes back and look at their past for 10 years, or further back, everybody in here has something that I'm not proud of. I'm not proud of what happened, but it happened. I can't change the facts. But I didn't know, <clears throat> you know, I drove tractor trailers, everything, and, you know, to deny me a permit to drive downtown because of something that happened in my, <clears throat> excuse me, in my past that was over, you know, if you look at my, my, my record, there's nothing on there past 95, nothing. Mr. Bell, if you had disclosed them all, you wouldn't even be here. You, you'd have your permit. That, that's, that's the thing, is the failure to disclose. Not your past, not what happened, but the failure to disclose. Is that right, Mr. Fields? All you had to do was put them down there. I want to go on record, and I'm, Mr. McNally, you need no defense, but I want to, I want to, you haven't been approved or denied anything. Well, I, but, I understand. But, and, 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 we're not, and we're not leading you toward that thought. What we are, all day long, every time we meet, all we are trying to get across to everybody who stands in your position with these same circumstances is you would not be here had you disclosed this. It's not holding your past against you. It, you know, most of the times there is a defensive position taken and we haven't even made a decision. We are trying to get across to you as well as to the public that we, we are trying to do our jobs and to keep them safe by knowing the backgrounds, everything in the background. And we, if, if you've, been listening to us at all. We are trying our best. I, I don't know how better to word something when it says, if you have ever been, and I don't know if there needs to be a parenthesis to say the amount of years does not matter. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know how layman we can make it, but, you know, we are going through an extensive amount of time and effort to not for you not to be here uh you know for for us to you know not have eight hour ten hour sessions and, and we'll do them need be but when they need be so it, nobody's holding your past against you I, I don't want i feel a little tension we we all have a past somebody picked up a piece of bubble gum whatever but that's not the issue here. The issue is, like Mr. McNally said, we wouldn't see you if it were here. And that's, now that you're here, we have to address what Mr. Fields did not see. Okay. And so when he doesn't see it and his office finds out that you did not disclose it, then you need to see us. And then we have to discuss why you didn't put it there. And that's the process. It's just, we have to go through that process. Are you with Old Town? Yes, sir. Are you Richard? Chris. 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 All right, would you just state your name loud for the record, please? Yeah, Chris Matter. I'm the operations manager at Old Town Trolley. And you're willing to offer Mr. Bell a job? I, he's been working there longer than I have. <laughs> yeah. He's an excellent trainer for us. Okay. Thank you for being here. Of course. I'll, I'll move to approve the application. Is there a second? I second. Any further discussion? 
All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mr. Bell, you've been approved. Thank you. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Yep. All right. exactly sure how to notice it but uh, uh, Mr. McHale are you present if you come forward you will recall that at your March meeting Mr. McHale and one of our inspectors had a conversation and had a situation on the street where they had an encounter and Mr. McHale accidentally drove over his foot you placed him on two day two months probation and said said so his probation ends today but you said you wanted to see him today so I wasn't, that was a new one in terms of being able to put it on an agenda. So under other business, Mr. McHale is present. He's prepared to go back to work. We've not had any additional uh, issues that I'm aware of, and uh, he's being released. So if there's any words that you wanted to give him, it's your opportunity to encourage him, if you choose to. I got one question, maybe, is... When you were here two months ago, you mentioned that you could not afford not to drive during this probationary period. Have you been driving since the, over these last 60 days? It's only, there's no cars, no to taxi. He has been out of his taxi to, as far as we are aware, he's been out of his taxi since then as you instructed him. But driving personal car could be in a Uber or a Lyft. Uber Lyft, yes. Yes? Yes, yes and I asked before I leave last time. Yep. And again, no instance that I'm aware of there either. And again, no action for you to take other than you ask to see him. You going to be respectful to the gentlemen down there who are trying to regulate this industry? Wow, oh, that was really fast. I'm sorry. Are you going to be respectful to our inspectors from now on? Yes. Okay. You don't want to be back up here, do you? Never. <laughs> I think that takes care of it, Mr. Fields. Mr. McHale, thank you for being here. Thank you. Go thank back you. to work. Can I, can I get my permit? You come back to the office tomorrow and we'll be able to take care of it, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Miss, uh, we have one last bit of business. Again, we have a few minutes. Ms. Costona has some information she needs to share regarding meetings and process. That's correct. So there are a couple of legislative changes to the Open Meetings Act that are hot off the presses, just recently signed by the governor. Um, one of them is more an issue for staff in terms of preparing for the meetings. Um, that is um, Public Chapter 213, formerly Senate Bill 27 and House Bill 23. Um, and what it does is it requires that 48 hours prior to a meeting, the government must make available to the public the agenda for the upcoming meeting and it must reasonably describe the matters to be deliberated or acted upon during the public meeting. We probably would have a practice of, you know, providing that information more than 48 hours beforehand. Um, so I, I don't think that's a huge change for us. Um, but there was an additional one um, that, that does affect the commission itself, um, which is um, a public chapter 300. Um, <clears throat> formerly House Bill um, 448, um, and basically it provides that for each public meeting, the public body shall reserve a period for public comment to provide the public with the opportunity to comment on matters that are germane to the items on the agenda for the meeting. Um, and it does say, and this is the part that you might need to act on, this may need to be on the agenda for the June meeting, um, that the governing body may put reasonable restrictions on the period for public comment, such as the length of the period, the number of speakers, and the length of time that each speaker will be allowed to provide comment. Um, and in general, you know, we, we, when we do have public hearings, which we don't do on everything at this point, we do it on the ones that have to, that are required by law to have the public hearings. Um, uh, we, we do um, always set a time limit on the speakers, usually two or three minutes, I believe. Um, I don't know that we've ever set a um, time limit on the overall time it would take to do the public hearing or the not, number of speakers, but um, you, you can require that they um, request to speak beforehand. Um, you can... Um, so, so what we are recommending, my, my department is recommending, is that um, uh, going forward, um, all boards and commissions put um, a period for public comment as the first item on the agenda. Um, now, you would need to specify by doing a rulemaking, 
by adopting a regulatory change um, uh, as to a maximum number of people to speak during the public comment period and um, also the number of minutes for them to speak during that public comment period. So that's what I would ask Mr. Fields to put on the agenda for June would be for you all to adopt a rule to clarify um, to what extent um, that public comment period at the beginning of the meeting um, will be limited in terms of number and amount of time people can speak for. And I'm not asking you to do anything today. I'm just giving you information about it and letting you know that we need to consider this in June. Can we also give consideration as to whether we want it at the beginning of the meeting or the end of the meeting? I know you're recommending it be at the beginning of the meeting and I'm going to take that, but I'll, I'm just thinking about our meetings that have a number of different agenda items. We could get really bogged down with trying to be courteous to the public because th this commission has been very courteous to the public and allowed them lengthy times to speak. I'm afraid of being up, like today, I wanted to get to the uh, SUMD uh, contracts because that was critical. Um, so anyway, if we just also give thought to whether we want it at the beginning or the end, and then also time length and whether we want to limit the numbers. I'm thinking that partly that if we just set a time limit, we may be able to vary the numbers of the speakers. I think that, that seems to be consistent with the law as well. And there's no guidance in terms of whether it's a 15 minute period or a 30 minute period. Obviously it shouldn't be a minute period. Uh, Not that I'm aware of, but it was literally just signed, okay. so. so we, we, between that, we will we will certainly have a, a time for you to speak. We'll have additional information, <laughs> and we'll do some research. And that becomes effective July first. <coughs> yes. Okay. And this will be affecting all boards and commissions in yes. Davidson County. The council is already the, the council is already doing it, so that'll do. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have no further business, Mr. Chairman. Your to adjourn. To adjourn. Make a mm -hmm. second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.